This is an interview with Russ Dizdar of ShatterTheDarkness.net. He, he is one of the leading authorities on demonic possession and exorcism and uh, satanic crime, um, satanic ritual abuse, cult crime. Uh, he has personally been involved with the exorcism of hundreds of demons. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Russ, thank you uh, for being here. I'm, I'm excited to see what we can learn from you uh, tonight. Let's start with satanic ritual abuse because uh, I think it illustrates how real this all is and how widespread it is and that it's in our backyards and it's being covered up. Um, can you speak a little on that? Well, yeah, the, the satanic ritual abuse, again, it's historic. It goes back in the Old Testament to the days of Moloch. You can see it with the Mayans. You can see it with you know, a number of uh, you know, you know, archaeological digs, stuff like that. But the kind of Satanism or ritual abuse we see today comes from old Europe. And uh, we see, you know, um, their search for powers and their search to advance the cause. So we have probably 4.5 million cases of multiple personality disorder, and they say about 80% of that is ritual abuse, satanic ritual abuse. So that tells you that it's a very big thing. Right. And uh, as far as it being covered up by law enforcement, do you have any uh, specific uh, indications of that? Well, I think that, um, gosh, when I was a police chaplain for a couple of years and worked there and I got to teach in the academy, they, um, in all the academies, you know, the academy stuff that I went to, advanced training on cult crime, things like that, one thing that's very clear, Chris, they tell officers not to talk about satanic crime, not to bring it out in the public, not to scare the public, just deal with the crime and uh, basically just, you know, I don't want to say cover up, uh, but the idea is, yeah, not put it out there. Now, we've run into some issues with some officers, too, because, again, while I was there, there's some great officers, but there's, there's officers that have trouble, too. And we've, uh, we had one particular person that uh, was involved in satanic ritual abuse and in uh, rituals in, in coven work. Hmm. And uh, you say that, in, uh, that it, they kind of, it was kind of known that they would uh, try to try to keep everybody, you know, hush-hush a little bit, but not necessarily anything bad, but that was, in effect, kind of coming from the top, sort of, of the, at least that precinct. Well, sure. Well, even at the police academy down here in Ohio, when uh, I was allowed to go in and take course, you know, some coursework that they were doing, uh, the trainers, I mean, that's what the trainers would say to the rest of the officers and the cadets and everything else, even though they showed dozens of slides of, you know, horrible you know, ritual abuse and rituals and people killed and, you know, pentagrams carved into a chest or a head cut off and all these kind of gruesome pictures we saw and all the factors they showed. And during the 90s, Chris, you know, every single, um, it seemed like anyway, every single department in the United States was developing a cult crime unit or a, you know, satanic ritual crime type unit that would learn the symbolism, would understand the, the, the motivations of the crimes and be able to investigate. And so books by law enforcement agents were beginning to be written and used throughout the 90s. Um, and so we, we, we definitely had a flurry of uh, direct uh, criminal activity. It hasn't gone away. It's just, uh, again, they, they think that it's going to incite panic to the community. So they're told strictly, uh, yeah, from higher-ups and trainers, not to uh, discuss it, publicize it, uh, or talk to the news people, you know, about it, that kind of stuff. Well, if one does a search, you know, and starts trying to look up satanic ritual ab abuse, one is uh, almost instantly confronted with the idea that it simply doesn't exist, that it's a mass hallucination uh, effect, and the, the kids were, you know, are being, these memories are being planted. Uh, a lot of that was pro propagated by a foundation called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Um, can you see if, can you, if you agree on that, and then maybe talk a little bit about uh, sure. that organization? Sure, I um, I, yeah, I agree with you on that. That there's been those who have said that because I've had to deal with that all along. Even when I taught in the academy, you know, officers would ask, you know, because for them they want, you know, they want the body, they want the bones. Even when we we would take victims to law enforcement, you know, I remember this one chief here locally would always say, "Russ, bring us the body, bring us the bones." Well, we brought bones back from from Pennsylvania once, um, and we've seen the crime, you know, slides hundreds of them. So it's not that the crime's not being committed. It's, again, um, on a deeper level of satanic ritual abuse when children or others. Now, for me, I've spent over 20 years working with victims. Uh, we developed a team to go after 
um, the perpetrators and to find out everything we could about them. So we see the links, we see the folks. We, you know, so there's no question on our part, um, no question on on the part of hundreds of thousands of victims that have been through psych wards in counseling centers and so forth. I think it'd be more hilarious to to believe that all these different people had the exact same hallucination. Right. So, and what what is that number like? I mean, what what kind of diagnosed? What do we what do we have to hold on to as far as how many people have gone to psychiatrists and been diagnosed? Sure. You know, that kind of thing. Right. Back in ninety, I think like ninety two, we did a seminar. We were doing seminars at the time then, and uh, I quoted from Holly Hector, who was a hypnotherapist from Centennial Hospital in De, in Denver. They, along with Hatford Ho Hospital in Chicago and others, um, developed a ritual abuse ward. There were so many cases of uh, multiple personality disorder that was connected to satanic ritual abuse that a number of uh, hospitals and their psych wards and so forth would set up a ward that would deal just with ritual abuse. Now her ward back in the early 90s, uh, that's all they took into that section of the hospital. She, um, in a book called uh, Satan Associates by Wendell Amstead, quoted uh, from the American Psychological Association, I think, I'm not sure where she quoted, but in that book anyway, it's listed at 2.5 million diagnosed cases in 1992-93. Um, that's gone way up now to where we in 94 and 96 and doing seminars, we estimated close to 5 million diagnosed cases, majority of which are, are satanic ritual abuse. But then, here's the problem, Chris, we have on the other side, half the people we deal with never been to a psych ward, a counselor, they're undiagnosed. So we began to estimate statistically 10 million, and then just two years ago, Colin Ross, a Canadian psychiatrist from a big center up there, he's a world-renowned psychiatrist, so forth, in his book, uh, he's now estimated up to 10 million, half of which diagnosed, half of which are undiagnosed out there. Um, that's a lot of individuals. Every psych ward in our city has people that um, have been diagnosed with DID, dissociative identity disorder, um, and probably the majority, 80, they, they say around 87%, 90%, you know, we found eight, by 95% of them uh, will eventually begin to talk about the satanic ritual abuse memories. That's a lot of folks. Right. That's a lot of folks to have say they have memories of, you know, being, you know, in a circle of people surrounding them doing absolutely uh horrible things you know i think that uh and to think that the very specific memories that they have um again the false memory Sy uh, syndrome foundation what uh, what about those guys well it's interesting because we've you know in dealing with some of the victims here locally we like one lady we were dealing with and helping her and talking to other personalities within her and doing deliverance with demonic presence within her all the stuff began to come out well her father began to contact by typing out on an old hand, right, hand like typewriter, it would send me cards and uh, um, and just kind of um, I don't know, like provoke or trying to let me know that he's trying to you know spy on us, stalk us or whatever. Uh, the father was a, a Nazi freak, uh, completely. His whole house was packed with Nazi stuff, things like that. But he wrote me one day about you know the false memory foundation that he was you know a part of or whatever, and he's prepared to use them if we went public uh, with the abuse allegations. Here's the issue: Dr. Orn and Dr. Jolly West were two of the founders of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. They were both CIA, highly versed in MK Ultra and mind control techniques. Um, You'll find some of the other people that were connected. Um, also, uh, it, it's it's just amazing to me that this kind of a you know foundation is set up to battle um, anybody who's coming forward and saying they have particular you know satanic ritual abuse memories. Um, they're very expert at knowing how to trigger. They they I mean they worked with it. I mean. These are the guys you have from the CIA. Our CIA has, uh, back when it was the OSS and Project Paperclip, what people can read about now more than ever, um, they were duped. They, the programs were brought in, and milia, many of the uh, satanic ritual abuse situations uh, and multiple personalities you know, disorder situations have come out of the MKUltra and the Monarch Project stuff. Right. Um, now again, now not every witchcraft coven is sacrificing babies, uh, but there is, but there seems to be this the whole lot of different flavors to the and belief systems to these covens at the uh, let's say anarchy level to quote 
Fritz Springmeier. Uh, but what do you say to the people that tell you, well, they're in a coven and they happen to know for a fact that this kind of thing doesn't happen and, and they don't even believe in Satan right. of the Bible and, and that kind of thing? Right. Well, as for example, Anton LaVey, we had interactions and wrote to him, and one of the consultants that we had years ago was Tom Wedge, who wrote the book for law enforcement called The Satan Hunter. He was law enforcement, and, and he flew out to meet with Anton. If you read all of Anton's literature from the Church of Satan, uh, they are a different flavor, like denominations among Christians. You have the Episcopal Church, or you have a Pentecostal Church. Uh, though they would both say they're Christian, they're going to be different in their liturgical styles, how conservative, things like that they are. That's true among Satanism. They have non-traditional, traditional. traditional. Uh, we've labeled some also psycho-Satanists like uh, Richard Ramirez. Um, you know, folks that were just individuals that got into it and went out and went crazy, or they learned whatever they could and, and hurt or raped or killed somebody. So the traditional, not traditional, you may have real Satanists that do get into, you know, cutting up animals, things like that. Um, no question about that. There's even books. I've got, I've got Book of Shadow things here and, and particular underground books that were given to us in law enforcement that demonstrate um, and show their specific rituals on how to cut a body, how to pull out a heart, how to do all that kind of stuff. Now, popular Satanists, so-called like Anton LaVey, um, in the Church of Satanism, a uh, Church of Satan from San Francisco, like Marilyn Manson is supposedly part of it now and that kind of stuff. Well, their declaration is they don't get into it, Chris, but when you read the Satanic Bible, you're going to see that they talk about the Enochian you know, um, uh, rituals, and there's going to be destruction and sex and so forth rituals. But individuals that we are counseling right now, right this very moment now, um, have, that have come there, one is one that, that has claimed to have lived in his home, was one of uh, three women, and uh, she's now telling another story about his work with hypnosis and what, you know whatever else. So I, I've always had a hard time believing that they're so-called light-level Satanists. Um, you know what they say in public is one thing, but what they do behind the scene for more power because they're all you know there's it's all about gaining even more power. And uh, once they get into that side of it and find the real powers, you know, then they're led into seeking, you know darker ones and po more powerful things for themselves and um, so there's there's a, a, a public uh, declaration that there's differences and Tom Wedge in the book Satan Hunter did acknowledge those differences um, but I'm not sure that they don't cross the line right uh, now you've infiltrated a, a number of covens uh, and it, it seems like I, I could be uh, wrong is that is that true well, we, we've done counter-infiltration work with um, some of the secret societies. As far as the coven stuff, we had some of our, you know, one of our guys did get invited and went into a, uh, to a meeting, and then individuals that we were working with that were pulled back a few, a few times took us, you know, to their sites and to their places. Right. Um, so, you know, and, and, and even right now, there's an ongoing, there's just, there's a number of cases that we're working. Um, but as far as any of our guys going into a satanic, like a black mass, right, right. they just couldn't, right. because they, if they're there to, you know, maybe made to cut, I mean, there's a yeah. certain oh, sequence right. of getting in, so they can't, we can only go so far. Well, I guess my, my question uh, was more on the people that you've dealt with from them, I, I suppose, I guess, um, now you've driven out a number of demons from people that were involved in, in various uh, stages or, or levels of, of this. Um, did you do you find that at, in the quote unquote let's call it real uh, theo theo I don't know uh, real Satanism let's call it um, do you find that the leaders or all the people in the coven have demonic atta attachment do they have it because they um, accepted it as a requirement or part of it or does it happen uh, to them by willingly participating in various rituals and spells is it kind of a subtle thing or is it a more direct thing? It's both. Um, it's it's really both because in a, in a real you know satanic coven Lu Luciferian group where they're really conjuring spirits and and listen Wiccans can conjure spirits but look at it differently pagans can conjure, conjure spirits but when you come to Luciferian Satanism where they really know that Satan's real they see him differently as the light bearer the prince so forth um, the bottom line is ultimately you're going to have to give up. Um, it's because it's really absolutely um, 
I don't know how, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's very much like being a believer in Christ. When a person accepts Christ, turns their life over, the Spirit of the living God, that's being called born again, born of the Spirit of God. There's a real uh, connection. There's a real thing that occurs. In Satanism, there's a counterfeit to that. In turning over, and I've got a book here by Father Maradon from the Church of the Black Goat, that discusses these rituals and, and, and has, you know, I read all of them that you go through and it's the same thing. You acquire in your commitment to Satan and your calling on Satan and giving yourself to Satan includes total renunciation of God and everything Christian in order to acquire the presence, uh, well, they might say of Satan, but primarily of demonic presence that would flow into your body. So many that we've dealt with, they, there's no question, they've invited the demons in when they do rituals and so forth, spirits do come. They do specific things to keep them contained, you know, in, in a power cone, things like that. So, um, and then they want the demons to, to, you know, they want to become more powerful. If you have, you know, if you have a thousand demons, then you're more powerful than the person that has a hundred. And, and depending on the types of demons, uh, depending on the types of rituals. Hmm. So they're going to have them directly and willfully and willingly, and we've engaged that in, in, a, in a literal spiritual battle face-to-face. We've engaged where others acquired demons. They just thought it was an energy or a presence. But then when we ex- exercise the authority of Christ, the demonic presence manifests or comes forward and literally speaks to the person. And uh, some people have been horrified that they didn't, they didn't know that that energy or power they felt was an actual entity. And have you ever asked uh, the demon at that point? I mean, things like what, what, uh, how did you get there? What, what, what door was let open? That kind of thing. What kind of answers sure. do you get from them? Yeah, we we always do that because when when the primary issues when deliverance you know procedures come and and people do want to get out of things um, before we kick them out or whatever we we do we we want to we want to seek you know how they got in and, and and so forth so that the person can what we call close the door. Uh, not allow that to occur. Now, if that's generational, that's one issue, but primarily it's because they've opened doors. Um, so, yeah, demons, you know, under the authority of Christ and only under the authority, they they don't, they will not obey under any other authority um, or anybody that supposes an authority. They they just simply, when it comes to the to the living presence of Christ, uh, the demons freak out. Uh, they are they shudder. They're in fear, um, and they will answer. Um, we don't try to engage in long discussions with them because right. their nature is to, to lie, and they're very good at it. They've been around a long, long time. Um, now, with the uh, w- you know, we're, we're fairly versed here about the the Nazi based uh, trauma based mind control and 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 the occult origins of of the Nazis. And it appears then you were going into this earlier, or seem to suggest that. The mind control was, in a sense, at least as far as the Nazis were concerned, and whatever trickled down to how whoever is using the technology now seems to be layering uh, demonic entities or spiritual entities of some sort into the programming, into the different personalities. Do you find that that's because they can get a personality to accept a demon, or is it a technical process? What do you know about all that? Yeah, again, it's similar and counterfeit uh, and opposite to the Christian side of things. For example, in the, in the Bible, it talks about a believer who wants to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so they can become a good witness for Christ or receive spiritual gifts to use uh, in ministry. Um, on the other, and, and, and that sense of, you know, I experience, I know what it is to feel the power of the Holy Spirit and to feel his, you know, movement and leading and so forth. On the other hand, when splitters split the human core, uh, creating what they call raw personality. Um, one of the first things is the, the issue of bonding, uh, to where there's an emotional bond with, with the splitter handle or whatever. And then, then programming, I mean, from that very moment, programming begins, just simply verbal saying what their name's going to be and who they are. And, you know, they're being lied to from the very beginning, you know, where the programmer, the splitter saying, I'm, you know, we're your creators, we're your fathers, whatever. And uh, from that point, whether it's, you know, they put it on a screen, they put, do it through loop, uh, driving it in, uh, everything that goes into that raw personality is programming. It can be very tech. Then once the programming is there, um, th- there is a conjuring or transference of demonic presence because that then will empower, uh, completely empower the um, the programming. And we've seen that. I mean, it's... There's a tremendous difference between somebody who's been through some programming or whatever, even have post-hypnotic suggestion, as compared to 
you know, hyper programming with demonic presence. Uh, that's why I think a lot of secular, you know, um, psychs and so forth can't break that programming because there's a power but that that continues to fuel it and 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 keep it there. And obviously, there's a public version of that with the Jason Bourne assassin type thing, but it appears that this is uh, um, uh, so widespread. I mean, if you look at the numbers of satanic ritual abuse and all of them being multiple personality, or some of them or most of them being multiple personality as well, it seems that everybody in the system doing the bidding of the system is also a mind control slave. It, wh where is this coming from now? Who, who's who's churning them out? Sure, um, and that's that's the best questions, Chris, that I know for people, and, and I, we've been kind of kind of crying those questions out. Like, if there's that many diagnosed cases, uh, and and wherever I've spoken so forth, I've said, you know, we need to ask, you know, who created them, you know, who who are the ones, who are the real handlers, uh, because now, 60 years later, I mean, if you go back to Esther Brooks, who wrote the book Hypnosis, uh, 1943, he's already talking about. Of course, he's brought in by the CIA. He's the American Psychological Association's president. He's hailed as a globally known psychologist and so forth, psychiatrist. But look, look what he's doing. He's writing already and showing in that book, in limited level even, uh, that they already knew how to, you know, they learned how to, you know, split a personality and create another personality and create a spy. So then they deal with in that book the weaponization, the hypnosis. And uh, basically, uh, they can call it post-hypnotic suggestion. It's it's really programming. Um, so there's a, there is like the Jason Bourne thing. There's like when we've met military-oriented ones from Fort Bragg and other places. Uh, the personalities inside, every one of them will have a purpose. Uh, in real chosen ones, we, they're called chosen ones. In real ones, here's what here's all of them have someone inside that speaks uh, fluent German. Uh, or in probably two, three, four other languages, when they switch personality, each personality is programmed. For example, there might be an assassin. One might be a, a sex slave. One might be a runner. One might be, uh, uh, you know, a doc, you know, oriented for medical care. One might be a high priestess, you know, and on and on. One might know how to do just conjuring. So there's a compartmentalization of uh, even the knowledge. Some of them on the inside don't even know that there's 50 others on the inside. But the handlers on the outside who know all the names and triggers, that's all they need to do is, is give the cue to, to bring up who they need to to do what they need to get done. And we've seen that enacted numerous times. And, it's, and, and one of the only ways to stop them, Chris, sometimes is just literally tackle them whole, you know, bring them to the ground. Because um, once they're, once if they're, if they're what we call intact and they're triggered, or if a sleeper inside is triggered, um, it's almost like nothing can stop them. Hmm. Interesting. And, and so there's a high level of military training in many of them, but here's the issue. Without breaking the satanic presence and power, which involves even, um, again, whether a person believes in the supernatural side of this or not, the issue is they do. And they believe that they can do specific uh, conjuring for invisibility. The Hands of Glory in September is used, that ritual is used for the powers of, uh, of in invisibility, uh, keeping it cloaked. Uh, the scripture speaks about, in prophecy 2,000 years ago, about this very type of thing, a hidden secretive power in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, that would operate until this, this big mass of chaos eventually would be unleashed. Hmm. Um, well, before we go too much further, uh, I'd, I'd really like for you to uh, take as much time as you uh, can to tell us about, in, well, in your experiences with these uh, spirits, um, what have you found out about the rules of their world? What are the demons afraid of? What are, are their goals, their ultimate hive goal, and what's humanity's role for it? And uh, just speak about what you know about the system. Well, well, there's a lot of biblical revelation that goes back even 3,000 years into the book of Psalms, chapter 2. Uh, there is an agenda, just like if anybody has studied biblical prophecy about the second coming of Christ or the first coming, with 300 prophecies telling that he would come and where he'd be born and how he'd be born. Now we have prophecies about the second coming of Christ, but we have um, uh, a, a large amount of prophecy that tells us of the ramping up um, and, and literally the... Um, uh, gosh, the advancement of... I mean, just as God has an agenda, Satan has a specific, detailed agenda. Uh, one of the Greek words used concerning his work is from the word we get method, methodology. Uh, 
we learned that they're very structured, uh, under great command, uh, that um, demons don't die when you cast them out. And, and many times the same demons from a thousand years ago, once the doorways open, they come again. But the ramping up means that we will have an unparalleled manifestation. That means there'll be more people possessed, more people conjuring, more people involved, more people have attachment, and even areas will have a sense of feeling of darkness than ever in history. Uh, biblical prophecy shows us that, uh, and what it is is God peering into the, to the future, not only of, of his side, what he's doing, but, but also has get, given us little snapshots to identify the level of uh, unprecedented manifestation. So we have 100,000 covens in the United States, possibly, according to Father Shefton. We have 65 million New Agers that are opening doors, uh, which they don't realize is demons are demons, spirits are spirits. It's either the spirit of the living God or it's the other spirits. So we have, I mean, I've even seen the last 20 years, we have so many cases. At times we were so overrun, literally, we had to have people sitting in the, in the waiting room waiting to get in next. <laughs> so you've got demonized people out there in the waiting room and you've got demonized people in the room. Uh, things are going on in the room. It, it, sometimes with staff, all five offices were doing deliverances at the same time while there were people waiting uh, for when they're done so that they can come in. So there's no question that it's been unparalleled. More books on spiritual warfare have been written for Christians in the last 15 years than in the entire history of the church. That tells you that there's a need for ramping up on the other side. Um, I believe there's a strict, uh, clear uh, agenda. If you read into the old lines of uh, um, Helena or Alice Bailey or David Spangler, uh, Paul Von Ward, all these other guys, Benjamin Crim, so forth, and some of the older Luciferians, their, their, their agenda is very clear. They know that there's going to be a great cleansing in order to bring about a whole new age, a whole new spiritual age. It's about a spiritual evolution. And uh, mankind is on the brink of it. The ascended masters are all saying the same thing, whether they're Tibetan, whether they're uh, the ones that uh, Helena you know, was involved with, or whether current ones. Um, Paul von Ward, in his book, God's Genes and Consciousness, he, he now you know, acknowledges the, a presence over him and communicating systematically of the advanced being. He calls them advanced beings. Uh, some of the older books refer to the Great White Brotherhood, but they're communicating the exact same message. And there is a sequence, um, but the agenda is uh, to, number one, the frog in the kettle approach, to kind of spiritually dirty the world as much as possible, uh, to keep it fogged out. And, and, and then the big thing, the big awakening, the big revolt, the big, uh, they call it the black awakening. And uh, that will clear the way in their view, real Luciferians, in their view, we've, we've sat down for hours upon hours in discussions with some of them. Um, their, their view is that they, they will bring their man into power because they need to grasp political, economic, and, and obviously spiritual power. Um, and, and that's that's the agenda. That's I, I don't in my own in my own estimation at this point. It, none of this is going away. It will only uh, broaden in in both earth earth changes, both in 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 this, the idea of, of chaos and sense of terror and problems, wars and you know everything will continue to break down until there is a um, a massive unprecedented release. Uh, and, and, and we can get into that if you want to, the, the Black Awakening side of it. That's, the, that's, their, that's their ultimate agenda, to, to collapse the systems in order. Uh, and and it's, very, it's very much like a coup, just like in Russia or other places, other na you know, countries or whatever else. Uh, to, in order to bring a new regime in, you, you have to get rid of the, first, the one that's there. Do you uh, America's, America's in trouble. I mean, that's, that's part of their agenda, the Luciferian agenda is to collapse the American society, not in just the slow frog in the kettle approach. That'll happen for so long, but eventually, Chris, I'm just telling you what their, their discussions, what my discussions with them for 20 years, what I see right now, there's no question that their sleepers are in place, and when that time comes, 9-11 uh, will occur probably in every city in the United States. Agreed. And I, I think that one thing is interesting that I've just recently thought about is that 
Uh, it came from a, a quote, uh, Albert Pike, about World War III, and it just made me think about what they, their a, a, a kind of a sleight of hand move would be to make this coming war, whatever it would call it, World War III, at just be so absolutely devastating to be uh, looked upon and be propagated on the people to be considered uh, the War of Armageddon, so that at the end of it, whoever who comes to save the day at the end of this incredibly long, bloody, devastating war where there's so much death and destruction, it can be the Antichrist, um, you know, posing as the end of Armageddon when in, in effect it was just the Gog Magog war. Um, any anything from them on that on that, or is that just? Well, they look at it as again. I mean, you got to understand that there's a there's a there's an incredible arrogance among many of the higher Luciferians in, in this sense that uh, they feel they know what's going on. Their agenda is uh, progressing forward. Uh, Pike would be somebody that they would have you know clearly you know his writings were were part of their whole whole system too. Uh, there's a reason why there's fifty thousand separate Masonic temples in the United States. Uh, in every city, every little locality, every place you can find. Um, powers have been released. If we can understand how the powers are released and understand the the agenda, uh, then we'll see w what has occurred since the 60s to right now. The second greatest proliferation of you know, occult-level, deep occult-level literature was released in the 60s here in the United States. The first was in pre-Nazi Germany. And so we see the effects of the literature materials, and then all of a sudden the doorways and people and involvement in secret societies, and the agenda there is kind of a miniature uh, glimpse of a global uh, attempt. And what's interesting also is it seems like God set the framework up that these uh, demons and another fallen angels can't seem to enter our plane effectively without without and maybe not any other way except for through our will. So there's just onslaught of trying to find different unique ways to get us to give our wills to bring them into the, you know, and, and they'll trade us off, you know, throw throw a wick a, a bone, you know, here or there just because they summoned them into their plane. Um, right. Do you find that it, it is contingent upon the human beings' wills for them to operate on our level at this point? Absolutely. The will, is, the will has to be involved. And an unaided will um, that begins to have some of the light level experiences, uh, you know, moves moves to the next and the next and the next. Um, and that's that's how left hand path, you know, occultism is anyway. It, it initiation begins with lighter level stuff and continues to move you down that grid. When we did infiltrate Bla the Black Sun camp of the OTO here, um, we got as far as them eventually inviting us to Chicago to excuse me go through a ritual. Um, in which we would be placed in a room that had symbols. I, I, I suppose it might have been some kind of Masonic, maybe, maybe their own, I don't know. But they would have a reader there that would read a story. And we would each have to be a character in that story, and anything the reader read, we had to do. Now, this is where they would observe your moral structure, because in the biblical picture uh, of the satanic breakdown, the moral structure has to be broken uh, in order for the spiritual deception to take place and the willingness to occur, so in the in the in the, in the OTO, um, they're observing. If you're, for example, if you're playing the part of Fred or whatever, and it says now Fred will uh, go over and have uh, sex with John, well, if, you know, if you're you know weren't gay or whatever else, if you're going to become a part, if you're going to break come through that initiation, you have to do everything that you're told within that reading of that story. Now, the story is set up to, number one, weed out anybody who's not willing to go that direction, because the next initiation would be, be even deeper. Um, no one's going to get invited to, the, to a human sacrifice of black mass out of no, you know, just out of, out of the blue. It will happen in degrees. And people that come out of it that we've let out of it, you know, that's that's how the the history that they were brought into it. Unless they were, you know, again, a child brought into it, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, but people who willingly given themselves and gone down that path, um, but but going down that path, they do become convinced. Satan is not the bad guy. Lucifer is the light bearer. He's the good guy. He was cheated. Uh, he gets to come back. Uh, he's going to be the one to um, eventually amaze the world with brilliance, knowledge, political savvy, economic abilities. He'll make the world one. And so David Spangler, father of the New Age and so forth, you know, talks about a Luciferic uh, invocation. 
uh, which was even done at the UN. So doors keep getting open on all levels, and the will sometimes is opened. And I want to say willingly, and sometimes again on the on the demonic side, you never get. I can you can never trust they're telling you the truth. Right. I mean, you can never trust they. The, if, if if we understand the art of deception, um, they are the masters. They are the founders. Um, Jesus said, Satan, when he lies, he speaks his native language. Right. No truth left in him. He's disintegrated into just that. People have asked me over the years, Chris, do I believe Satan really believes he'll win? I do at this point. From all that I've seen on the demonic realm, and I've heard them scream at me and yell at me and say things, I do believe they, they think they can pull it off. Um, now, let's let's talk about that. Um, what specifically do you... Uh say when when uh, t driving out a demon take us through the process a little bit well sure the um excuse me the um the bottom line for it is luke 10 jesus said very clearly in the perfect tense in the greek that he has given every believer in christ authority to trample literally this is very powerful um to trample you know the demonic realm to overcome the greek word nike meaning the decisive victory so when a real believer understands that and you and has and acknowledges an appropriate set of authority when they do encounter a demonic presence uh it's always done in an oral sense spoken uh a matter of fact uh, almost like 99.9% .9 of the time Jesus never touched a demonized person uh when we deal with it it's just a simple thing of, sometimes we already know that it's there prior to even calling it up or commanding it to come forward because they usually can tell who we are before we can tell who they are. Uh, if they're in a person, they're looking, they're spotting. We have to realize that they are real entities with superior abilities. They are the founders of telekinesis and clairvoyance and, and all those kind of powers that they give to individuals. And so they're already reading me sometimes before I get into a room or when I walk into a room. But with discernment, the Spirit of God, there's times you can feel it, sense it, know it, God gives me a word, and then we go into, um, you know, commanding it to come forward without harming the person. That's part of the process. Sometimes if they just manifest openly, like has happened a number of times, or even through the person to the ground, we immediately command you, you know, not to harm the individual, not to harm anybody else in the room. You will be contained. It's literally just giving orders because of the authority of Jesus. Uh, when I was a Buddhist Taoist. That was never, you know, before I became a Christian, they, nobody ever taught us that kind of stuff. And spirits, it was a whole different world. Um, demons don't listen to any other name. They don't listen to any other authority. But when the a real believer with that authority exercises that orally, um, and, the pre, and then you can feel the presence of Christ literally coming and striking, it's almost like you can feel a rush of the power of God uh, that's when the demons scream, literally, just like the scriptures. They scream, they, uh, they they agonize. Sometimes they want out of there quick, and sometimes. But that's when we'll say no, not until you know you say you tell. You know, sometimes the Lord will give me a discernment that there's 13 spirits, and I'll say, how many's there? You need to tell me the truth, and they'll say seven. <laughs> and this happens often. Um, and we'll say no, there's 13, and you know you're lying, you know God and. And uh, there's been times we'd say, we're going to send you to the abyss. They fear. That's one thing, Chris. They fear, absolutely fear going to the abyss. Uh, none of them ever want to. Um, some of them just want to cuss you out and get out of there. Many of them are afraid that higher-ups in the demonic realm, in, including Satan himself, may you know, judge them or harm them or do things to them if they tell anything. Uh, or they'll get in trouble for losing a battle. Um, to them, it's it's all real war. It's it's real stuff. It's real entities. Uh, there's been times where I've seen we had five officers in the room with a guy that we believe killed two girls here locally in, a, in just a horrific slaughtering ritual. Um, when he showed up, he first first came after me to attack, and uh, then when all the officers brought him to the ground, he was leg chained and arm chained, and then he would go completely limp and quiet. And then he would look up like himself and say, what's going on? He looked very passive. And if you start to get close to him, you can see instantly the change. And this horrific voice screamed out in front of all the officers, we are the legions that shall rule the earth. 
guy that he ran in the office, of course, just picked him up, uh, legs and arms, and, and took him to a psych ward. Hmm. Uh, is there anything specifically not to do during uh, an, an exorcism or an encounter? Um, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, it, it very clearly, I would say, as a believer, that that really no, you know, non-believers shouldn't try. Uh, if they don't, have, if they don't bear the the person and authority of Jesus Christ, uh, they will get harmed because uh, the demons they'll play games at first or whatever else, uh, but they will end up getting harmed. Um, I would say what not to do is you know don't take your attention off of what's going on. Never, never, never believe the demons, even if they act like they're crying and there's you know they want your sympathy. It's it's all it's always a game. Uh, you never, never can believe them. Um, are some demons harder to cast out than others, and uh, what do you yeah. attribute to that? Yeah, I believe there are, there are some that are more powerful in that whole hierarchy of, of, of spirits. For example, uh, you know, again, in light-level uh, Wiccan stuff that we've seen people come in. We had a girl come in, and, and I looked at her, and she couldn't hardly talk to me. I said, are, are the spirit, you know, are they talking to you? And she shook her head yes. And I said, are they wanting you to get out of this room? And she shook her head yes. So immediately I just began to pray, and of course she was thrown to the ground, but it was over in five minutes. The mother was there, and, and uh, it was done. Now, in cases of satanic ritual abuse or in, in really heavy-duty stuff, especially where a priestess or somebody wants the powers, and they have gained what they call power demons, the higher the ritual, what I mean by that is, the longer, that's why some rituals are designed to, to carry out human torture for an hour. Uh, there's one ritual that deals with sexual, uh, engaging a person sexually to heighten the sexual energy, to at the same time continue to cut a person, stab a person, draw blood, uh, to where you, you're you literally having them uh, totally horrified, uh, along with the sexual energy, the fear energy, all of that. It culminates what they call the third power when they finally will then kill. Um, Again, here's their belief. Because the demons feed off of human energy, to me that means the more, quote, energy, the more um, open the doors are for the demons to come, the more you've appeased them, uh, that bigger, more powerful demons um, are attracted to bigger and more ugly type of rituals. Uh, we've seen that over the years that some demons do. They seem very light level, very in a, in a, you know, unable to do any kind of battle or stay, and they're out of there in, in, in two or three minutes. Uh, there's been times where we've had to really engage. And power demons also know how to draw in and have under them many lesser demons. Uh, so you might be dealing with uh, 60 demons at a time under the ruling power, uh, you know, under the ruling spirit, um, who will constantly push out the little ones to be dealt with first using them really as demonic fodder uh, in a battle uh, to keep themselves hidden. At that point, do you so, just continue to pray, or, or, or does it intensify? Does the yeah, Holy Spirit give you words to say? And... Yeah, it, it, well, it, it, can, it can really be different in the sense. In regular deliverance stuff where there is maybe a, you know, that's where the Spirit of God gives a discernment and I'll, you know, sense, uh, you know, and we'll go after, and I always tell, you know, in our training, we tell individuals, you know, command the ruling most powerful, the ruling demon to come forward. If you know there's more than one, and usually there's more than one, it can be two or three, it can be 50, but command the ruling spirit to come forward and that when you get ready to cast that demon out, uh, commanding it to take in all the demons that it brought with it so that 50 can go out at one time. Um, that's, you know, that, again, that takes a little bit more and more time because you might end up dealing with two or three other demons first. You're waiting on the spirit of God to give you insight and all that's going on. Um, so that might take a little more time, and uh, they may try a lot of other tricks that we, you know, we have learned over the years. But now on the other side, again, here's a Monarch Project individual from Fort Bragg that's been through uh, stuff with Colonel Shannon, stuff with, uh, with Michael Kino, stuff with all these other guys back then. They knew Gottlieb, they knew Esther Brooks, all this kind of stuff. They're very high-powered. They're coming from a high-powered coven. Uh, they came down to literally do battle. They were sitting next to me in the vehicle. I continued to feel an antsy feeling. I knew it was, uh, you know, was in something inside the person was was already, you know, beginning to surface and 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 create really. Uh, I just, uh, it was real. It was just really bad. And and I, I inwardly, without verbally saying anything, I began to pray against that. 
and out of this person's mouth, they just said blankety blank cuss, you know, at me and said, cut that out. And I looked at them and I said, what? And the person looked at me and said, what? And I said, well, well, what you just said. And they said, I didn't say anything. So inwardly, I began to pray again. And the same voice came out and said, you know, cussed again and said, cut it out. So I began to pray outwardly this time, you know, out loud. And all of a sudden, this individual went into this chant. Uh, it sounded Arabic. They were calling on, the only name I could understand was Aromain. And they were calling on the powers of Aromain to come and aid them. And I've never seen, you know, this, this is a person that came down. Um, it was like they came to test the, our, our abilities and uh, test the powers, and they really felt they can call on um, big, big powers. And that went on. I got louder. They got louder. Um, and it's not so much that a Christian has to get louder. Uh, Jesus would usually, he didn't have to scream or yell. He would just, he would say that he spoke to them sternly. Or he used the Greek word ek, just simply a command, you know, a point blank command. Now, in that case, it just kept going. They kept getting louder, so I just kept praying, and I wouldn't stop. It was just a constant, nonstop praying and commanding, and it was just, it was like a fist fight spiritually. <laughs> they just were fist were flying, but then all of a sudden they grabbed their head and shut up. They jumped out of the car, they threw up, and they ran off, and they were gone for about an hour. Um, and, and that was, that was pretty, and here, and here's the problem. There's a lot of the, that, that person there is called a chosen one, uh, or they would call themselves a satanic, uh, super soldier or, uh, a warrior monk type thing. And they're trained for that kind of battle. Part of their training is to learn how to, uh, hide the demonic presence through human shielding of the personalities. And here the body of Christ is totally unprepared for it. Um, I, sometimes I think that uh, God sending Jesus is something so creative, uh, uh, so profound, so technical of a, of a play, of a move by God, that, that it's hard to, to understand. And, and a lot of Christians only understand it as a catchphrase, i.e., Jesus died on the cross for our sins. You know, and, and, it, and it's okay to accept that by faith. You know, we're even encouraged to do so, but... Uh, something just universe-shattering happened there, and something that requires a serious study to understand. Uh, can you help us understand the the mechanics of why we have authority over evil now? Sure. Well, it deals, I think, with human genetics and our spiritual, you know, who we are. Uh, in, in Genesis 3, after the fall, the proto-evangelism was spoken by God that the Messiah, you know, Messiah would come eventually, and, cru you know, he, he, though he would have his heel bitten, he would crush the head of the, of the serpent. Now, from that point on, again, here's what I think, again, a lot of even Christians understand, when you, and again, they don't have to go read a thousand other books, uh, you know, and that's fine to research, and we've done a lot of research, but biblical revelation, once again, spells it out. The demonic side knew way back then that someone was coming. And sometimes Christians don't understand the fact that this is historic. This is just as the prophets were searching by the Spirit of Christ when these things would occur, just as there were 300 prophecies, including born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, on and on and on, uh, his bones wouldn't be broken. 1,000 years in advance, Psalm 16 declares the resurrection. Um, all these biblical prophecies were for our benefit to understand and, and identify the Messiah the first time, let alone the second time, which I think that's going to be unmistakable. But the other side of that is that, that it's very clear that Satan knows the Bible backward and forward. He understands God's agenda. He knows what God is doing. So when anybody reads Revelation 12, uh, primarily the Revelation when it refers to Satan as the dragon, the ancient dragon, it's the full force of who he is. Well, he's standing there in front of Israel waiting for the Christ child to be born. It's very clear that he knew the Christ child was coming, that he was prepared, that he was in Israel visibly. I mean, not visibly, but literally he was there. Obviously, he was there at the birth. And it says right in Revelation 12, he was there to devour the Christ child. He had to do everything he could. So here's what's very important for us all to know. He knows prophecy. He knows it all the way to the end of the book. What he's doing now is in preparation for Revelation 19.19. 19. Uh, one of the reasons he's creating people, one of the reasons for the mark of the beast, one of the reasons for gathering nations together, it's not just for his rule alone. It's for his gathering the biggest army in human history, the most advanced army in human history. Revelation 19.19 19 says that the beast, 
brings, and this is after Revelation 16, where the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, in pure ritualistic form, send out demons for, you know, to, the, to the kings of the earth, those who have already given themselves over, um, to gather them together for the great day of God Almighty. Well, what is that day? That's not Armageddon, where nations fight against nations. That is, that is the day, Revelation 18, 19, where those armies are gathered together to do one thing, to fight the descent of the Lamb of God in his return, his visible return. They're there for one reason, uh, gathered in the Middle East as, as a physical, spiritual, you know, uh, super, super, uh, I don't know, what it is, super spiritual, you know, satanic army or whatever. It's for one reason and one reason alone. And that is to stop the descent, because Satan knows the prophecy, Chris. He knows what's coming. And so what we need to do is back up now and, and, um, and look at some of the biblical prophecy that God strategically has given. Um, and you're going to see that Luciferians and writers, and even past writers, who all get bits and pieces from so-called ascended masters, uh, that they're getting, they're, they're getting the agenda spelled out um, towards that day. So everything tells us in biblical prophecy or among real Luciferians, we have to grab political power. We have to grab military power. We have to grab economic power. We have to grab numbers. We have to eradicate or eliminate as many uh, on the opposite side as possible. Eventually, we have to have all of you know, Israel, Jerusalem, and we have to be amassed there. What's, what's the reason behind that? Because there's a biblical prophecy of the visible return of Christ coming there uh, to that very spot in Israel. Um, and, 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 and so when I think in terms of scientists right now, when those ideas pop into their heads to create new weapons or this technology, I believe the technology for the mark of the beast will come out of inspiration that occurs in, 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 in mill labs. And um, it will come directly from that side in the development, uh, the progressive development of uh, the ingathering uh, of the largest. That's the satanic in-game. Hmm. We're talking with Russ Dizdar of ShatterTheDarkness.net. Uh, Russ, you do a, uh, a number of audio seminars and things teaching people and, and pastors uh, how to be spiritual war warriors. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. We've done them locally in uh, different places, a few states and stuff we've done things. But uh, we decided that because, you know, for the advantage of many more people getting hold of stuff, we, we began to take those courses and put them on the Internet. Uh, one's called Confronting the Powers, one's called The Black Awakening. They can be anywhere from uh, 10, 12, 13 to, to 25 hours of separate you know, lectures, seminar lectures, um, along with uh, just a notes of an outline like for the whole course and some resources. So we've put them on the web. I think there's four, four right now. The fifth, uh, No, there's five right now, the, and the sixth one's coming pretty soon. Um, so there's courses that can be gotten and, and gone over you know, in that sense. Other than that, we do local ones, and, and from time to time, we get invited to go places to do them. And, and uh, so it's all about exposing, training, um, you know, sharing the stuff, and, and uh, getting people prepared. Along with the other side of our work is just primarily evangelism and dealing with victims, and, and, and dealing with a lot of victims direct. Right, you do a, a lot of really great things. The podcast is great. Uh, it, I know a lot of people who listen to this show like to to listen to podcasts, and you produce one every so often. It's just, and that's great. Again, you can get that at shatterthedarkness.net. Sure, there's a lot of free ones out there, and I think somehow on the net because we 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 just kind of you know fell into this as far as uh, individuals like you uh, doing this kind of uh, you know format and then putting it out there, and uh, sometimes you know I'll get a call after something's been out on the web a year ago and someone said, well, I heard this or they, they'll email me or whatever. And it's, it's kind of amazing, Chris, how it works. And uh, it, providential, too, uh, that Luciferian Satanists, they, they write us, too. Uh, victims write us and, and uh, you know, it involves in, sometimes we've done deliverance over the phone with, like, we had a guy from Canada. Uh, we had, uh, we have people in the courses from Australia, England, United States. Um, a lot of people, Chris. A lot of people know that something's in the air and it's ominous, and that they know it's head, headed, you know, in a certain direction. Do you anticipate the Black Awakening, as you call it, to be something unmistakable when it happens, or like, or do you think it's just a gradual build-up, uh, i.e., you know, people dabbling more and more and opening more doors? I think the Black Awakening, as they describe it, I think the Bible describes it as the Great Revolt. 
in Second Thessalonians 2, I think it will be uh, uh, as, a, as a surprise and shock, but also as uh, something that uh, is totally unmistakable, just like, say, 9-11. You know, that day all of a sudden when I heard about it and I turned the TV on and I'm seeing the power burn, then I, I got to watch live the second plane, you know, hit. Uh, that was astounding to see all that. Then all of what occurred, you know, with, 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 with you know, and I live close to Cleveland where one of the planes was on the way here and we were hearing reports. Um, so that was unmistakable. Now, again, the Black Awakening, you've got to understand, it, is, it has been something in the works directly from our tracking uh, 50, 60 years. Uh, it is, to, in my, our view, a, a long-term uh, historic Luciferian goal that's now coming to final manifestation. Um, it'll be so unmistakable, but it will also be politically, militarily uh, unstoppable. Uh, it will occur. And um, that's, that's, it's not to say about, it's not about being fatalistic. It's about, you know, God, when God shows the future, he's not just saying it's fatalistic in the sense that he made it happen. No, he's also just showing what mankind is opened up to. And uh, Bob Rosio in his book, Hitler in the New Age, one of the greatest phrases that I've spoken it a thousand times probably, the phrase that he put in his book was, uh, deception always leads to destruction. And that's true. Hmm. That's true about the Luciferian agenda. And uh, so ma the, the deception that's going on now, uh, which, again, the New Age movement, the largest cultic movement in the history of Christianity, um, but that's seemingly nothing compared to what's underneath, but it has prepared the way. The fog, frog and kettle approach, the progressive thing, like you just mentioned, it, it's been here. But the strike that's going to hit, um, it's going to hit so hard and so fast and so broad and so unilaterally that, um, that there will be such a collapse um, but that's not the end game. It's not about Satan wanting to, to, to destroy because he still needs the next step. And um, the next step is, is to gain the powers and the loyalty and to gain a new system and a, a rule and a reign. But then there's a next step after that. Do you anticipate all those, the laws of spiritual warfare still being in play and still being in effect? Like our Holy yeah, Spirit? Sure yeah. Yeah, I, I sure do. I, I, you know, it doesn't matter. Even if it occurred today, obviously many people lose their lives, um, just like on 9-11 and stuff like that and, and other things. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I suspect that millions will lose their lives because in that process that we've dealt with, we, we've learned that they've already, you know, they, they have sleepers planted, you know, law enforcement, government, military bases, whatever. There's going to be sabotage. People will lose their lives because in the process of the chaos, um, they look at it as a ritual. They, they see it as a bloodbath that draws more powers. It'll be conjured. I mean, the Black Awakening will not occur without rituals being done. Uh, it will be a satanic release. It'll be a satanic Pentecost. And uh, it will be something that unleashes uh, that, uh, uh, such dark powers along with the chaotic stuff. But in the process of all that anarchy, they already know who they want to eliminate and get out of the way, who'd be, who'd be resistors and so forth. Uh, that's already an issue concerning their sleeper assassins. Uh, they already target, they take pictures, they observe, they place. Uh, that's why they're in hundreds of, and, and thousands of churches in the United States. Uh, you take out pastors, you take out leadership. Uh, that's why they're in government. That's why they're in FBI, the, you know, the feds. That's why they're in military and on bases. You need to take out those who might be able to form some level of resistance. Let's talk about that. There, there being a lot of times the pastors, the youth group, you know, ministers, the the choir leaders, uh, they, I mean, they have an agenda, and that is to infiltrate these churches and things. They, and, and your experience, have they done it um, effectively? And I am reminded of a story I heard you tell about uh, praying in church and, and having, you know, uh, an uh, old woman in the front row uh, mentioning, uh, you know, having a demon or something to that effect. Maybe if that be yeah, appropriate. As well. Sure. Yeah, that can happen in a lot of places. As a matter of fact, I think if I went to a lot of churches to preach, and, and sometimes, and it wasn't so much that the church I used to pastor would do this purposely, but we were just, you know, we were just committed to evangelism, healing, deliverance. It was all in the same boat for us, um, in the sense that we looked at it as the holistic ministry of Jesus, that that's what he did, that's what he trained, and that's what we should be prepared for. So, when we had folks in our fellowship, when we would have certain services, when we would sense it, we would pray. If there's anything here, anybody has a voice in their head, or 
you know, or we need to command the manifestation of any demonic presence. Well, that's definitely brought people down to the altar for prayer for light level stuff, but it's also caused immediate manifestation right in the middle of the church. Um, now, what's true about these the the, the chosen ones or satanic sleepers um, is that uh, yeah we get called I mean we got we had their, we've been tracking they're in so many churches. Um, but they may be there in the choir. They may be there, you know, uh, helping out because the sub-level personalities that are loyal to the covenant, loyal to that dark side, they know what's going on. The upfront person may be completely amnesic. They might just be going to church and think, man, I really like this, or maybe even programming, Christian programming put in their head. And that's, that's really tough because, again, overwhelmingly the body of Christ is not trained to detect that. Uh, the good news is God knows what's going on. He knows the Judas project issue is right in the center of the church again. Uh, but they're but they're highly trained. When they come in, they know how to, you know, their goal is to, you know, start unleashing powers. They're doing reconnaissance. They're finding out where leadership lives. They're wanting to get involved with leadership. They want to compromise leadership. Um, so there might be something that a front person just, you know, they feel like they need counseling. They feel whatever. Uh, very pitiful, and you begin to help them. But on the flip side of, of the inside, the co-conscious, cult-loyal, demonized, powerful personality is peering out, uh, probably doing rituals, uh, maybe giving uh, gifts, demonized objects that are gifts, all to weaken the church. I think during the 90s, in so many of the cases, they were seeing how far they can go without being detected. They were seeing how much warfare they can do with just, you know, causing uh, churches to collapse or have internal problems or, or bring a pastor down. Um, uh, but ultimately, it will deal with even, you know, the issue of uh, sleeper assassins and, and more destruction. Uh, but, but gosh, I, I don't want to say they're in every single church, but our experience at this point is, for example, there's a large church here. It's got probably 10,000 members. And um, they're a very strong evangelical church, but definitely not strong in the area of spiritual warfare discernment. And uh, we've done over 100 some cases of deliverance. There are people coming to our offices, multiples that have come to us. We've tried to talk to the leadership. They just will not go this direction. So in that church, you've got high, you know, cult loyal um, multiples that, that have even taught Sunday school, that, have, that, are, that are, you know, involved. And um, they're there for a reason. Do you find, a, and the sort of the flip side of that, do they infiltrate, let's say, certain televangelistic things to just make it look bad, to make it look ridiculous? I, I feel like there's a there is some of that going on, and I, you know, I think there's no question of that, you know concerning that because, uh, and that might even be true concerning the PTL case with the woman. Um, I can't say that yet, but there's some indicators that tells me that this girl, this woman involved may have been multiple. And that means they may have had a handler with, you know, highly sexually trained, sexually energized personalities on the inside, uh, along with warfare that would go against leadership to fatigue them, to bring confusion, to bring headaches. Uh, they hit, and this, one of them used the term, we use blitzkrieg warfare, lightning warfare, something the Nazis used to talk about. But they, they, they adapt, they will kind of weaponize this spiritually to hit hard and strike in multiple, you know, from multiple uh, vantage points. And uh, so we've seen churches go down. I've seen some good churches go down. Now, they will target churches that might seem more powerful. Matter of fact, again, the one from Fort Bragg, um, when we dealt with them for a number of years, and a lot of stuff we discussed, but they brought back materials once and they drew out right in front of my face one time uh, Bohemian Grove and all the different places and drew out little underground places in the Owl. This is back in 1994. Um, they drew out all the stuff there and talked about the ritual being real and wanting to release powers that no, mo many of those people that kind of have no idea what they're, what, what's happening to them um, to be influenced. Um, so I think that, uh, and, and this same person you know, talked about how all of Northeast Ohio was grid mapped uh, that they color code the churches, and the ones that they think are a problem, they will do warfare from their covens against against them. And they've been doing, they understand spiritual targeted spiritual warfare. They've been doing it for years. 
Uh, that's what a ritual is all about, targeted. You conjure the spirits. You send them in a specific way. You're, you're charging them for a particular thing to go after, to confuse, to bring you know, sickness, death, whatever. Um, if that's not working well enough, then they send people there to begin to get involved and to begin to create havoc. And you do the same thing. You speak of target, targeting uh, prayer-wise, uh, specific targeting. Can you speak a little bit about that and, and what, how you feel about that? Sure. We, you know, back when in dealing specifically with this person out of Pennsylvania, we've dealt with 100 folks out of Pennsylvania um, that are chosen ones that are, you know, really highly trained satanic, you know, warrior-type monks. Um, when I began to see this back in the late 80s and early 90s, and I began to just look at, you know, you know, because we understood you know, deliverance and we were already doing stuff and we understood prayer and level of spiritual warfare. But, you know, as I dealt with it, the Lord brought to my mind one time a specific verse and I went and looked up the original Greek and it was desis. Uh, it means there's a difference between just general praying and specific, I mean, like you write it down type praying. You're writing exactly you know, what you want. So we begin to apply that to, um, as we pray for souls, pray for revival, pray for spiritual awakening, pray for healing, pray for whatever, we include as a normal part of all of our praying, praying against, praying for the exposure of. Um, and any piece of information, it's kind of like what I did uh, to kind of, I don't want to say test it, but you know, I just began to follow what I felt led. I began to you know, take any bit of information I got from victims coming out of covens, of individuals, places, whatever, and then put it on paper, paper you know, just write it out. And, and begin to use that page as like a little journal, and I would you know pray through that, and I would thunder the prayers and targeting for exposure, whatever you know I felt you know whether it was they were doing a ritual on a certain night, or whether there was a person they kept calling them by name, and we never did find them. So we began to put their names, addresses, places, all the information, praying for God to give a confirmation, or God to expose, or God to bring about providential you know face-to-face -face meetings with some of these people or their coven sites. Um, and then target the ritual times and target the high priests and target the types of rituals. Now, when we begin to do this, this individual comes back from Pennsylvania. They popped out of the, the car. This officer brought him down. And they got out of the car, and first they begin to yell at me immediately, saying, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're blankety-blank, you know, spiritual warfare stuff. And inwardly I knew. I just knew immediately. I just smiled. I said, wow, what do you mean? And I wouldn't tell him what we were doing, but I just said, why, what do you mean? He says, well, we haven't hardly been able to get a spirit to show up for three weeks. Now, what we've learned in the last 12, 13, 14 years with this kind of praying, and we have like 13, 14 pages uh, that we will go through of information. Uh, on one of my pages, I might have uh, over 100 names of satanic ritual abuse victims, along with uh, coven leaders and military, you know, all kinds of stuff. So the prayers are, Along the way, as we continue to pray, that God will give us more information, more confirmation, new victims come forward, we find a site, uh, someone comes in and tells us, uh, we engage that and we begin to see um, that when, especially when we do it as a team on a weekly basis, it's like after we do that prayer thing on Monday night, before the end of the week, we may end up with another case, more information, a phone call in, uh, a ritual site that's been you know, you know, told to us, uh, confiscated material that was brought back from a coven, given to us, uh, and it just it is just literally un, uh, you know dislodged, and it's really kind of freaks them out because nobody's really gone after them, and the issue is this because they have been operating in an uncontested secrecy, and as long as they can operate in secrecy, they can do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, once that's hit, 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 hit and targeted and God gives more insight and more insight and more information, you, hit, you know, then it just, it, it's, it's like instead of bombing the countryside, now you, you're literally bombing the, the military factory. What kind of uh, general prayer tips would you suggest for those listening? What kind of, uh, how, how do you pray? What, what is, what's your system? Sure. Well, um, I, in my personal life, I use the Lord's Prayer as a, as a, as a format. Uh, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I, I worship first. I just I spend time to worship, interact with the Lord, and just you know just fellowship with the Lord, and just that's where it's just you know um, it's just relationship and worship. And uh, from there, I move into intercession, uh, praying for His kingdom, you know, to be you know come about, His will to be done. His, and, and and so it's really praying the advancement. Uh, I don't decide what His will is, but we we do implement the will of God. 
uh, and we do advance the kingdom that way. So we pray intercession-wise, praying for lost souls, praying for the church, praying for leaders, praying for the advancement of things, praying for revivals, praying for you know Christian events, things like that. Um, uh, we will go to praying for daily you know necessities, daily bread, our own own issues. Uh, we'll pray to make sure that if we have any sin issues. Lord, you know, convict us and show us and, and, and repent of anything or, you know, or we'll pray, you know, lead us not into temptation. You know, I'll be kind of get like a heads up about what's coming. But then when I come to the part where it says delivers from the evil one, again, that's, again, I don't quote the verses. I just simply use it as a pattern. Then I come to warfare. I pray sometimes what's the enemy doing? Um, just like Jesus knew that Satan had come into the room, the disciples were all eating food, and all of a sudden, Jesus looked at them and said, Simon, Simon. And in the Greek, it's plural. He said, Satan is asked to sift all of you guys as wheat. But I've prayed for all of you guys that your faith would fail. So um, Jesus knew who entered the room. Jesus knew who asked to destroy them. And uh, they didn't have a clue. So spending time in prayer, um, listening to the Spirit of God, which takes time to yield to his presence, to learn, to listen to the voice of God, uh, to pray, you know, because the, the work of the Spirit is inseparable from the work of the Word of God. Uh, it's going to be a work that works together. Um, so then we, then, then that's that's pretty much general for me. But when I come to the warfare side, that's when I might, you know, open the Shatter Prayer Notebook and and uh, or have specific individuals that I'm dealing with during this week, and I'll begin to go over things that might be even five, six years old, but now something new has come up. And uh, so we're constantly targeting the areas, and we have a page, for example, the top of the page says pray for exposure. Then we have other stuff typed on it, and then there's certain scriptures, and then we already have information down, and we keep adding to that as, as God gives us things, and so that's just that general sense of exposure in the area, then specifically concerning covens and, and victims and people and individuals, and in that we target... Um, secret societies that, we, that we're engaged with, which leads us sometimes to go and investigate and do research and, 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 and to kind of do, we don't usually say this publicly, but we kind of uh, counter infiltration. Uh, the spies of, of Israel that went into the land and came back, you know, or went into Jericho. Um, but we do it for the sake of how are we going to pray? We do it redemptively. Who needs to be led to Christ? Um, but we also do it in the sense of what needs to be stopped? If there's a ritual going on or someone gonna be hurt, um, what needs to what needs to stop? And uh, then there's like I say, a number of other pages involved. We well, one page just says defeat and destruction of demonic powers. We'll be praying through, asking the Lord for any discernment of any rituals and powers and things and stuff that's been done against us or anybody else or anything in the area. And if we get discernment on it, then we we respond back in prayer. Um, we we when we when we got the sermon on a, a coven in the Kent area, we began to pray and go up there and spend hours in the middle of the night tracking down rituals, you know, times and, and dates. And um, it took quite a while, but we eventually, uh, in a total miraculous providential way, uh, walked into a room where there was a person there that was a victim of satanic ritual abuse. Their arms were all cut up, and we went, immediately went into talking to personalities with them, and the demonic stuff began to surface. Uh, so there's a Nazi-oriented, a long-term coven that's been there 60 years. Uh, now we've come up with two other victims in that area. Now we have a friend that I ate dinner with last uh, week. He works for the CIA, that understands our work. Uh, he's up there in Ravenna. He's at a hospital, meets a girl named Carrie. Um, uh, bottom line is, uh, the bottom story is, uh, he starts talking to her about everything else calls me and says, Russ, we've got one for you. I've got one for you. You know, that she's married to a satanic high priest, and all this information he's giving me on Friday, uh, I'm going to connect you with her. So he goes back to the hospital to get her phone number and to give her our phone number. And as he goes into the hospital, uh, she, she had walked out that morning and quit after being there 14 years. So now the process is finding her. So it just, it, it's just ongoing. There's just so many different cases, so many activities around us. It does take, you've you got to spend time in prayer. You've got to spend time. The normal praying in biblical times, I think, is, is, is both uh, offensively in a sense of uh, extending the kingdom, but also praying against things. Nothing wrong with praying and using the weapon of prayer in the biblical sense against evil. Uh, and and that's, that's where we've seen 
uh, by the authority of Christ and by his work, that's why we've seen so much activity. We believe we've been able to peer through, break through the satanic secrecy, uh, which then unveils what's going on. And without that, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it just continues, but cloaked. That's a good word. I, I know that's going to do a lot of a lot of good out there and a lot uh, set people on the right track um, for that. Uh, you know, uh, something that we've been looking to a lot in this show is the uh, the Nephilim connection and how it relates to the New World Order and all this that we're talking about. Um, what is your view on it? What what what's going on with that? Well, I think again, here's where we shouldn't take just a, a little view of Scripture. We should all of Scripture is there for a purpose, and even in Genesis six, where it says the Nephilim on the earth in those days, and and then again later, the Zamzumi, Zanakites, others, there's bloodlines from those Nephilim. When the Watchers came down, had sex with the women, basically raped them, and the children that were born, the genetics were changed. There's no question about that. Now the issue we can talk about, you know, back then and all that kind of stuff. My personal belief is that. It's Nephilim that, that raised up the ziggurats and the pyramids and all that kind of stuff that, to involve uh, greater dimensions, gateways, and so forth, because they've grid mapped the earth. Um, our issue today is, Jesus said in, in the end times, it'll be just like the days of Noah, that level of evil. So big issue now is, are there Nephilim now? And, and at the very least, I can say there's an attempt for them, both in the Aleister Crowley left-hand path stuff looking for a moon child, uh, in the military side of things, there's no question. I sat one time, astounded in a car, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, with an officer who recruited me to be the police chaplain and got me into teaching at the academy on a call of crime, who, who, who turned out to be a high-complex military multiple. When I got down to talking to a personality named Piet uh, that was at a base in Holland, they described the, the genetic, you know, the way it works. They described and even, you know, wrote out a little bit how... They believe, here's what they believe, whether we do or not, they believe that if I got every demon out of them, they would fall over like a lump of clay. Because the ritual that is done in a trans-generational way uh, is done in the, in the husband and the wife, both are in, in bloodline. When we say bloodline, we're talking about traces of Nephilim blood that already has in it um, kinetic, you know, kinetic abilities, uh, for, you know, like, like psychokinesis and and all the rest of the stuff. It's already the properties. It's not the same as possession. This is beyond possession. It's in the properties of the blood. That's why the demons love the blood issues, because there's an attachment. Um, here's Christians need to you know, theologically understand, where does your spirit attach to your physical body? Life is in the blood. It may be that our human spirit is uh, literally... Uh, where spirit crosses into the physical realm or touches or connects is within the within the system of blood. Um, that's just that's another story though. I'm saying on their side, that's how they look at it. Uh, that's why they will uh, when they when they take blood from one of their kinds of victims, uh, 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 one that they feel is already powered up. That's why they want to drink the blood or sell the blood to another coven because there's powers and properties in that blood. They've been attempting the, the, the recreation of uh, Nephilim for a long time, Chris. They, they, uh, I, I believe that the demonized ideology of the Nazis, the scientists, I believe that's what they were learning. I believe that's what was happening in the Hall of the Dead and the discussions in the science, a demonized science because the spirits were trying to train open minds, open heads, uh, demonized minds and heads on uh, you know, a new process of entry. Though the new watchers can't come down and have direct level sex stuff, there's no question we've dealt with case after case after case of individuals, both men and women, who've had sex with demons. Uh, a history professor here at the university, uh, he's sitting down, Chris, talking to me about this incredible encounter sexually, uh, the best sex he ever had, on and on and on. I, thought I had to just finally stop him. Now he's gone through major deliverance. I mean major deliverance to break all this, and it seems that he's doing pretty good. But I believe that they've been attempting this for a long time, and here's the reason why. Well, not only because of the information of the Luciferians and stuff, um, and I think that we can clearly see there's biblical traces of this, but um, I believe the Antichrist will be uh, uh, probably Nephilim-oriented. He will, he will be, and, and if we don't understand, I mean, here's where, I, again, I hear sometimes, and I love theology, and I've taught theology for 20 years, but a lot of theologians don't understand the depths of the spiritual side of even of biblical revelation. 
Um, think in terms of the incarnation of Jesus. The Spirit of the living God effected the immediate conception uh, inside the physical womb of Mary. So you have spirit to human communication, spirit to human co conception. So there's no question from spirit to human conception can occur. Obviously in the God-man Christ where his very genetics and nature is both fully God, fully man. The only, in the Greek word, genesis, the only one of a kind. Now in the Nephilim issues, it's the same type of thing. When, 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 when the watchers came down and had sex with the women, they created an incarnation but not of infinite God, immeasurable you know, God with, with human flesh to where you have God-man. You have finite, fallen, corrupted you know, angelic presence uh, commingling with human. And so the genetics of, of they're not really human. They're not fully demonic. You have a new species. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the flood was not just because of humanity, but because of the corruption of the bloodlines and, and how far things went. It was really a, a way of saving humanity to fulfill the prophecy given in Genesis 3.15 of the coming Messiah, whose genealogy written out in Matthew and Luke and so forth, uh, takes us from him back to Adam, where none of the, his genealogy is connected to any kind of tainted, occultic, demonized, uh, Nephilim, uh, you know, bloodlines. He comes from a pure bloodline, and there's a reason for that. I believe the military has been doing it for a long time. And I believe the military cult multiples that we've been dealing with, uh, the ones that have really been there from the 50s, uh, that have, have eventually now in their 50s have become the trainers and, and the ones that do the stuff. Uh, and they keep learning. The science keeps getting, in their view, better. For example, they uh, tell me how they, they've been working for years upon years uh, to develop the power of resurrection. That's pretty interesting to me, mm. since the Antichrist will have a mortal wound, die, and be resurrected in counterfeit uh, to Christ. The Antichrist is not just going to be a person that all of a sudden at 30 years old finds himself possessed. They are a bloodline uh, created, uh, genetically created, uh, uh, counterfeit of the real incarnation. It's an incarnation of satanic presence, not just a possession. Hmm. How do you feel that the genetic manipulation of whatever it is uh, at that level, it, it, do you feel that that has something to do with the um, the UFO sightings, alien abduction, that kind of thing? I, I've even heard that these gray type entities are even at rituals. Have you heard that before? And what do you think of the whole sure. The business? Sure. Well, you know, Guy Malone and the guys down from Roswell, New Mexico, we were down there years, a couple years back. Um, they really got some really great insight. And uh, Joe Jordan and all those guys... Um, I, I really believe, because, um, you know, in interacting with, you know, abductees or whatever else, uh, the same principles are there about blood, about it being taken uh, forcefully, powers against them, uh, genetic is you know, issues, whatever, and breeders and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of similarities, and I think that Guy Malone in his page uh, down there, I think it's called the, uh, oh gosh, Ancient of Days Conference or whatever, yeah. uh, Alien Resistance or whatever, they have a page that, that that shows the similarities between satanic ritual abuse and uh, abductees and what they talk about. Now, our, the per person, again, we had here that was in direct fellowship and connection with uh, Bud Hopkins and brought me uh, in a yellow packet uh, part of Bud Hopkins' new book and pictures of Bud. By the way, he's, he's, very, he's very into pornographic literature stuff and writing, uh, which a lot of people don't know. But, um, but I think that... Um, I think that those in the alien realm, uh, they're dealing with a different class of demonic, you know, presence. Um, there's ground level demonic stuff. There are celestial, terrestrial. There, 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 there are principalities in the air. Uh, the demonic realm comes at us from different directions, uh, even into the stars. So. Um, it's very possible, I, I, don't, I can't give any biblical facts on this, that, that Nephilim prior to the flood did survive, or by the, either way they were here afterwards, uh, that they did create incredible technologies, and I think that's what's occurring, I believe that's what's been occurring in science for some hundred years, uh, that was heightened, whenever there's a heightened occultic activity, you're going to find a heightened science. 
but science that becomes unethical and moral, uh, like the Nazi doctors. It always seems. I, like, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. I was just going to say that it just seems like it, it always is seems the same kind of gnosis stuff of the Tower of Babel. Like here, let here's some neat little stuff that you guys don't know about. You know, in exchange for who knows what. You know, uh, just just see it as the. Satan knowing a whole lot about the the mechanics of the of the universe and, and is able to you know throw us a, a technological if you want to use that word bone you know of understanding of some how to use something or harness some energy or something and then you know in exchange for worship basically or sacrifice. Sure. Well, maybe the Collins brothers could even go into look you tracing it again in, in the area of sciences. I, I really kind of wonder how many scientists you know woke up in the middle of the night with a new idea in their head and then begin to work on it. But where did the idea come from? See, in demonic uh, interaction we've dealt with for years, we see how it works. You know, thoughts, involuntary thoughts and feelings can be pumped into a head that already has, already has a predisposition in the sense of that they're closed off towards God, but they are open to, their ethical side has to have been broken down. That's why there's a whole debate over the ethical stuff, over the cloning and genetics and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole issue there. Um, ethics has everything to do with the next stage of, uh, of elitist spiritual evolution, uh, or at least the promise of it. Um, so when you read Second Thessalonians 2, when it talks about the coming of the Antichrist or the lawless one, uh, he comes in accords with the work of Satan, counterfeit signs, wonders, and miracles, and, here's what everybody misses, and in evil. That word comes from the idea of moral evil. So when, when, when the moral structure can be changed, that gives that's a receptacle for the spiritual instruction, and uh, and and so I believe that there can be guidance, bits and pieces, and progressively, uh, even in non-possessed people, scientists, whoever, they can get the ideas, they can get the stuff, uh, and uh, but again, it's it's kind of like the way it's kind of like the way. Uh, secret, you know, the agencies do it. It's it's information that's compartmentalized, eyes only. Satan only gives out so much here, so much there, so much there. He knows the big picture. He has all the pieces of the puzzle, um, and he knows how he's bringing it all together uh, because he's working in that same way, an agenda. Um, but but it but it, the core of that agenda involves, you know, again the the. The, the allegiance, because we find and, and demons don't, you know, when a, if a person dies, the demons don't live in dead carcasses. When a ritual's done, any demons that was in or on that person, they're gone. They're either, they're either transferred into another person uh, through blood drinking, whatever else, or they've been released in some kind of, you know, curse or, or a specific, you know, command of attack somewhere. But they don't house themselves in, 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 in dead human carcasses. They, they, there's nothing there. Um, they need the human soul. They need the human structure, uh, the living person, uh, to to bring you know bring things through. So it's not always that he wants to kill everybody. Um, uh, primarily the resistors, because he still has an agenda. And, and the New Agers have no idea that the the commitment to elitist spiritual evolution. And the principles of a belief that they're they're going to they're evolving to a new consciousness. Um, I, I don't how, I don't know how they can bypass House Bailey telling them that the ascended masters told her that Christians, real Christians, or you know whatever, uh, they're going to have to be there's going to have to be a cleansing. If they don't if they don't comply, the spiritual side is telling them they can't bring humanity to that new level of consciousness, that new burst. So either we comply or cleansing. Well, obviously cleansing for Alice Bailey in the communication that Ascended Master meant, um, annihilation. So it's predicted in the book of Revelation, or demonstrated at least, that there will be at one point an attempt to annihilate the body of Christ worldwide, the largest martyrdom in world history. Hmm. Speaking with Russ Dizdar of ShatterTheDarkness.net, now you've been uh, the focus uh, of a lot of different types of attacks uh, in, in a way, curses, hexes, even physical attempts on your on your life. How do you um, avoid it, and how do you avoid well? How do you avoid being affected by them? Well, every believer will have. We we talk about four levels of spiritual warfare primarily. 
There's others, including piggybacking a cult level warfare. But primarily, every believer, you know, will have sometimes oppression come against them. That's what Ephesians 6 is all about. Or the day of attack, like Ephesians 6 deals with the day of evil, put on the armor of God, so forth. So every Christian will have times of oppression and sometimes times of direct attack. Um, that's normal to me for anybody. That's why we should understand authority and spiritual warfare and the, the power of the Word of God. Now, on the other side, a Christian can open up to attachment. Uh, Ephesians 4, or real possession. The Greek word actually is diamazoid, which means basically a certain level of control. So those kind of things are out there. What we've learned now, though, that you know, we usually talk about we open the door, like Ephesians 4 talks about. You know, be angry, don't sin, don't give. You know, don't let the sun go down your anger and give the devil a, a foothold, a topon, a legal right to your life. So as long as we don't do that as believers, then we eliminate, we, we're literally, the doors are slammed, and God's got the right, and the, the enemy doesn't have a right. Here, the other side of that issue is when, when um, occultists, you know, have uh, progressed in their development of um, spiritually sending out and attacking, that's why there are death rituals, uh, sick, you know, sickness rituals, plundering rituals. It's all about, you know, uh, a conjuring spirits and powers to attack. So they open a gateway. They open a doorway. Um, in my yard, there's no ferocious dogs, whatever else, but if I have a neighbor that has trained his dogs and I'm out sometime and then he gives the command to attack, that dog can come across into my yard and uh, bring me some trouble. So they can bring trouble. And uh, there's a level of, again, growing in the Lord. And that's why I think that prayer formula I talked about, or not formula, but pattern about worship, intercession, daily needs, sin issues, so forth, and then deliver us from the evil one, that's where I am praying, Lord, is there anything you know, coming? That's where it's like a heads up. Like Jesus knew what the others didn't know, let alone the charismatic gift of discernment uh, given to some believers who may, what I say in that, they just simply have larger antennas than the rest of us Christians. All Christians have the Holy Spirit and have a level of discernment. But um, and in prayer, you can gain a lot more insight to what the enemy's doing if you're willing to listen. Uh, Jesus came to the one church in the seven churches of Revelation and told him, you know, gave him the heads up. Satan's coming. It's put some of you in prison in days, but be faithful. He just gave him. He just told him what to do. Be faithful to the point of death. He didn't stop. Um, he just told him what was coming. So there's been times where in prayer, I got a sense, or you know, the Spirit of the Lord, you know, showed this is going to be happening. Or even before I walked into a room to do a deliverance on a high-level multiple, um, you get a sense. So I've learned a prayer map prior to going to that room and uh, learned that just that prayer mapping in the sense of seeking the Lord for discernment issues, is there anything coming, including, including the work of astral projectors and remote viewers and other stuff. That's a whole other level where the human spirit is empowered by the demonic and, and, and drawn out uh, to bring you know, effect also. So it's just a matter of learning what level of incredible weaponry we have when it comes to the demonic side. Uh, we pray for the good, blessing, salvation, healing, and deliverance of people. But when it comes to the demonic side, we only pray one thing, a defeat, destruction, stopping, canceling, that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes the demons can inspire a person to do harm. Uh, Satan entered into Judas, and he immediately went out and betrayed Jesus. Um, a, a demonized multiple only have a personality has been this, this is what's occurred to us a couple of times walking into a room uh, where you know I'm writing notes and across from me is a woman and a military sergeant brought her in and um, as I look down to write a few notes as I'm talking to her next thing I know is right past my head you know barely hitting my head but my hair um, and slam into the desk I look up and she's crazed, her eyes are glazed over, and there's a, a military bayonet stuck in my desk. Um, they pulled it out. I mean, they, they, were, they were very, uh, you know, when, they, when the programming and demonization kicking together, again, as I'll say, they're almost unstoppable. Um, on the one hand, I've seen where we've had to rebuke the demonic side that kind of, um, say, weakened them or brought them down to their knees. But then there's the, the physical human side. Uh, spiritual authority does not affect the human will in the sense of you can't command a human will to stop. 
You can't command a human mind to stop. Spiritual authority that Jesus gives us does not affect the human will or the human mind. It only affects demonic presence. So <laughs> attacks can come. People, you know, covens can be, you know, can, you know, conjure and send stuff to your house. Sometimes they leave you notes. Sometimes they've sent it in the mail. Um, I was given a uh, uh, picture of uh, hooded people with a, a bleeding baby, and it, on the bottom it says, "This blood's for you." And it came from the Brotherhood out of Pennsylvania. And the, and the, and the Satanists explained they did a, a, a high-level ritual, killing a baby on your behalf for us. Well, I don't know if they did or not, but I did take it in prayer, um, and I know they would have done it, you know, to do things against me. But they're doing that against a lot of people. Um, even years ago in the 90s when Larry Lee wrote a book called uh, Can You Pray With Me One Hour, I think, something like that, or Weapons of Our Warfare. It was one of his books. At the very beginning, he talks about being on an airplane, seeing a guy that he thinks pr is praying a couple of times, and he eventually says, hey, I see you praying. You know, what, you know, can I ask you what you're praying about or whatever? And the guy goes, oh, you, 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 you have no idea. I, you know, I can't really go into that. And he goes, like, no, I really want to know what you're doing, you know, and it looks like you were praying. Well, he goes, well, I, I was a form of prayer. Yeah, I was praying. He says, I'm a state. Basically, he explained he was a Satanist. He was being given an assignment to do specific warfare against specific pastors in a specific part of the region. Um, and our difficulty is, Chris, that we don't know all the time what's being, I mean, um, what they're doing all the time. The good news is if we're walking with the Lord and close to the Lord, God's going to give a heads up. Ultimately, there's going to be protection, and the weaponry we have, if we use it, is absolutely decimating to that side. Right. Um, well, to that end, I got well three basic questions, sort of, uh, about that. What what kind of verses or phrases or thoughts give you faith and courage when you're facing evil? Is there anything that that typically runs through your head or, or encourages you? Well, I think Jesus, more than anything else, is just. The source, I, I guess, you know, I think in terms of the attributes of God, the, you know, the, the finite, which Satan is still finite, the demons are finite, uh, in comparison to the infinite. And when you think in terms of God's attribute as infinite, even as he's housed in human flesh, uh, that didn't dissolve the, the, the attribute of infinity. God is infinite. God is so vast, so big, uh, that one of the attributes of God is incomprehensibility. We can't comprehend everything. Uh, because God is so vast. You'd have to be God to know him backward and forward, and there's no backward and forward to know. I guess to me it's just that Jesus Christ is the victor. He's, he's, uh, but it's not all about just that he came to clean up the mess and deal with the evil. The motivation, Chris, is that God so loved the world. He loves us so much. Uh, he's a relational being. It's demonstrated in Jesus, his care for humanity. He had no problem dealing with the demonic. And of course they, you know, so when I look at Jesus and I see the demonic realm shudder and shake in total fear, when I see Jesus not sweat worrying about, you know, Satan getting him or demons getting him, uh, when I see him giving us authority, uh, and of course we see the end game. The sad point is that the reason Satan gets so much ground in anybody's particular life, let alone uh, um, nation states, and eventually the global world, is because uh, the masses open up uh, and, and give, it just shows us that, that humanity gave him the room. Right. So the things that encourage me, again, is just the victory of Jesus, what he has done, the power of the word of God still, and, uh, and uh, even when I fought my best and done all that I know to do, um, because we're we're in the middle of a number of cases, a number of things going on right now, and and uh, you know there's times you think you have authority, and you know we've dealt, dealt with you know hundreds of demons and demon de deliverances and all that kind of stuff. Um, ultimately, when you go back to the Psalms, Psalm 37, uh, Psalm 18 specifically, Psalm 70 and Psalm 71, uh, it deals with ultimately that God arises and attacks the enemy. That um, in behalf of the, the, the fought against believer, in behalf of the uh, wounded believer, in behalf of uh, a believer that's just at times even exhausted, God uh, doesn't leave it up just to us alone to battle and to use authority and do things. It demonstrates again and again that he rises up and attack, literally attacks them. So I, part of a spiritual warfare praying is sometimes saying, God, just, Lord, I'm just, you know, come and attack what's going on because there's so much of it sometimes. And I see this the same 
operation in the book of uh, Romans, chapter 16, verse 20, in dealing with the empire of Rome, which was, of course, you know, the emperor worship, and obviously Satan had his throne there, and uh, there was uh, where there is that kind of uh, alternative spirituality, you also see a, a level of, of massive blood persecution against Christians. Uh, so much so that Nero had a coin struck and said the Christian religion, you know, he literally thought he had eliminated or annihilated Christendom. Uh, but God gave a word in the book of Romans in that verse that says that he would soon crush Satan under their feet. And, of course, Rome, as a mighty world empire, fell on behalf of God protecting the body of Christ, the indestructible body of Christ. That's amazing to me. He wins at every turn. Jesus is indestructible, the church is indestructible, and Israel is indestructible because of the divine origins and purposes of both. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Jesus warned us, uh, in effect, that if we, you know, lived as he did and did the things he did, that the world would uh, do what they did to him, sort of. Um, and that, But also, you know, we have this uh, various encouragements about uh, our protection from God. And how do you reconcile the two ideas, I suppose? True, because, I, you know, I've seen some of my own staff in the past, you know, fall uh, under spiritual attack or, or give up. I've seen Christians give up, and I've seen some harmed. And, and uh, though, um, you know, in cases where we have not been harmed on a physical level, I think we've been harmed on other levels in our, our life as a family and so forth. We're still in a fallen world. Um, Christians still will be persecuted at times. Where the enemy has gotten a large political stronghold, uh, you know, there, there, there can be, um, though there will never be an annihilation of the Christendom and of all of Christianity, and though the war will be won overall, uh, battles from time to time will be lost. And even in our lives as believers, at time we might feel that we've lost here or there. But keep getting up and keep doing it. And uh, ultimately, there there should be a succession and 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 and, and progression of, of of victories. No matter no matter how deep the battle, I've had many people say, oh, "I don't want to do as much as you know you guys have done." Listen, we we are no heroes, Chris. Um, I don't have anything anybody doesn't know, uh, doesn't have. The only difference would be my motivation is to see people get saved and get to reach to anybody anywhere. Evil inspires me in this sense to fight against it because I see its destruction. To use to learn the weaponry of God, to go against it, to see people set free, delivered, and helped, because that was the ministry of Jesus to set captives free, uh, you know, the prisoners released, and so forth. Um, so, it's it just comes down again to the relationship uh, to this incredible King of Heaven uh, that no matter what occurs, you can't give up, and uh, you know. Um, if, if there are Christians that fall and stumble or, or, or when persecution does come or Christian brothers and sisters in Sudan, uh, thousands have been slaughtered. Um, because the floodgates, again, the laws of uh, engagement there have given room to the enemy politically and uh, through that kind of stuff. So I'm sure here in the United States, if we didn't have some of the law and order that we have, that there would, there would you know, there would be there would be more of us you know there would be more of a persecution towards believers i think that uh faith is important as far as uh i don't know it's kind of hard it's just such a hard thing to say you know i what i love uh was it, when you talk about um god demonstrating his power when the when the faithful confront evil i, I heard a podcast just yesterday where you were talking about David, you know, fighting Goliath and and, and that yeah. kind of thing. If you want to kind of expand on that, I think it demonstrates, sure. you know, that God Almighty is is with you, and if He's with you, who can stand against you? Well, that's what I love because the truth is, um, it reminded me of of John Knox, the wicked Queen of Scotland. It said, uh, "Fear the prayers of John Knox more than an invading army." Well, this is true, I think, in the sense that. Here you have Goliath that may have come from Nephilim blood. Obviously, he was some kind of giant. Uh, and, and the Philistines, obviously, being a highly demonized. You've got to realize that all those little nations around Israel, uh, they were into blood, drinking, killing, sacrificing their sons and daughters, cannibalistic. You know, they were, they were not, there was no secular states. There were no uh, democratic, uh, atheistic, agnostic states. They were all in some form of God-goddess worship that, that, caused them to have such a hatred for these people that had Yahweh as their God because of the spiritual antagonism. So, 
when Israel comes or when when Goliath comes, look what he's doing. He's he's a, he's constantly blaspheming and and he's screaming at Israel about the God of Israel. He's he's literally in trying to provoke them by by slamming their God. And these great experienced warriors, where were they? They were up in the hills and they were hiding. They were hiding behind the rocks where they were where Goliath couldn't get to them. Um, notice what occurs. Nothing happens in the rocks other than they got to stay there. Uh, they got to stay humiliated. They got to stay defeated. And no activity of God happens up in the rocks. But when David finally is moved out of his uh, out of his uh, passion for God uh, to go down there. Uh, that's where the sovereign aiming and power and demonstration that threw a little boy uh, that would uh, go down there and fight in the name of the Lord God of, of Israel, the God of heaven, and unleash. Um, in the Old Testament, you got to remember that the powers that w- would come on the nation states, when Israel was fighting one of the most pagan and, and cultic worshiping you know, nations ever, Moses, when he had his arms up in prayer, they were winning. When his arms went down and the intercession being a stop, the other side would win because the other side would sacrifice, call on their gods, uh, kill their own kids, spill blood to gain powers so that the spiritual powers would house or tent over the physical powers and the determining factor would be who, um, whose spiritual powers or God uh, would, would be given the room to operate in the greatest way. Obviously, with with David taking the stance that he did, and through his faith, he went out there. Obviously, God had the God works by means. He never does a miracle without a redeemed being, a person involved. Uh, he doesn't do any answering to prayer unless there's a prayer prayer, <laughs> unless there's someone to do it. So, I see God shows up on the field, destroys Goliath in this incredible turnaround, demonstrating that the power of God is not a matter of size of a human being. Uh, but by the by the sheer uh, openness, so he went out there in faith. God loves faith, and he went and, and literally he poured through that uh, passion and that faith in a warfare sense. And of course, Goliath was defeated. Israel was you know all excited, um, uh, although we don't see them repenting very much over that. Um, <laughs> so the church should never be afraid. Out on the field is where I have seen the power of God. Out of the field in front of these people. Uh, you're seeing some get saved, some of them to hate us, some of them swear they're going to kill us, destroy us in the end, all these kind of things. You know, we've heard this so many times, and, and obviously we're all going to die sometime. We're all going to go out. I don't want to go out like a chicken. I don't want to go out like the guys in the rocks. And, and that's not even my focus. My issue is just, is there one more person that can get saved? Is there one more person that can get delivered? If Antichrist is already existing out there somewhere, and he's soon he's going to come to power, uh, which I think can occur in the next, you know, within the next five to ten years, truthfully. Then what are we going to do? Uh, I, I really do believe much of the body of Christ will, will, you know, coming to those times, you know, are going to be hiding behind the rock, and it's, it's sad because no power, uh, no sense of the hand of God is demonstrated when we shut the doors uh, and limit the Holy One of Israel. Right. Um. Let me uh, just get a few more questions for you, Russ. Um, let's go with uh, this one. Um, do you see any connection? Well, let's go with this. Uh, what about astral projection? Uh, we've just seen a recent news story where I, I've read through it. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, but it looks like that they have uh, uh, been able to re- reproduce it in a lab, so to speak. I've had uh, reservations that this was something that was... I don't know. With sleep paralysis, you notice them trying, and you you said you you've actually astral project when you were um, a, a Buddhist, and I just want to know what's your view on it in the in the whole scheme of things. Well, I think is it a is it a go ahead. I, I think that it's a capacity that we have the ability, but we can't do it without some kind of presence helping us. Uh, Elijah, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel went up and out. Paul went up out of his body, and John on the Isle Patmos went out of his body, but all by the Spirit of God in every case. And they were all shown and directed by God, you know, all that he was going to re- reveal. And it, it corresponded with the scriptures and the purposes of God. Now, on the other side of the fence, like I was taught by Master Ong about how to leave the body, what it would feel like, how to talk to the ascended masters. And, and if they ever asked me to let them come in my body and speak through me, a channel, which never, you know, I never got to that point. I got saved right in the middle of all that. But 
when I look at um, a light level where there's people practicing and trying it out, or we read the light level information concerning uh, concerning Ed Dames and Buchanan and, and Monroe and you know all the rest, you know all the different guys that came from the from the Stargate project and remote viewing. Remote viewing, uh, Ingo Swan understood that as the father of it because it all involved a projecting outward and abilities that go beyond the normal human. Uh, and I guess part of it is that you know again in, in the in the lab there's there's a belief of a Luciferian the Luciferian doctrine is enhancing the human abilities to godlike abilities. Uh, it's a promise towards it that, that never really comes about because the finite being can't give you infinite, can't give you what the infinite can. So, yes, I, there's no question. I know exactly what it feels like to, to literally lift up out of my body. Your spirit is literally projecting up out, still attached. Um, it's incredible. It's weird. Um, I look at it as we're entering into the second heavens. The third, of course, where Paul was braced up, saw things that he couldn't even speak, didn't have the vocabulary. Um, I believe the ether of the remote viewers and the astral plane of the astral projectors, and for example, my Buddhist Taoist teacher, was he called it the Great Universal. I believe that's the second heavens. I believe that's where all the demons and angels, that's where all the warfare is going on in that realm that eventually and at times manifests into this realm. Um, I believe that it either has to be the Spirit of God that lifts you up and out for His purpose, or another energy form. And I don't want to reduce the Spirit of God to an energy form, but the Spirit of God is the power. He, he is the power of God. He hovered over creation. Um, demons can make a person feel their energy, feel their presence, um, tingling, heightening them or whatever, without them ever knowing that it's a real entity. So, in many cases, like for example, we did a did a deliverance with a remote viewer um, that believe you know I, I discussed how did you finally get into it? you know it was all about curiosity somehow synchronistically they got a hold of some books you know so there's a there's a satanic uh, synchronicity that goes on to to align them because of their openness the will and uh, then they finally you know get to the point they feel and there's that first time when they finally break out of the body. Um, and uh, begin to do things, depending on what they've read and learned and so forth. Um, and uh, this person got to become, do this very you know, strong art. They learned to weaponize it, of course, too, into the area of psychic assassination and triangulating three people at a time. Uh, they discussed trying to break the barrier out there in the dark realm, uh, or the ether, ether, as they called it. There's a barrier they, they, that none of them could get, you know, get through, uh, they showed me all kinds of militaristic, uh, um, again, application to the, rele you know, leaving out and going out, let alone getting information from the enemy, that kind of stuff. They learned also how to attack and hit the mind, to learn how can they twist a mind, how can they create uh, a heart attack and, 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 and you weaponize it, in other words. Um, here's what occurred. As we're going through this, I'm beginning to discern this is not just energy. There's an energy form. And so as we're going through this, I said, do you mind if I have a prayer? And it's like, okay. So I prayed that whatever presence or power was there would be contained, could not go anywhere, deceive anybody, and eventually we commanded it to come to attention. And it spoke its name, Argon. And this person was pretty fascinated because inwardly they could see that it looked translucent and beautiful. We commanded it to look as it really does, as, as, it, you know, as it really is. The person was horrified when they saw it because it was gnarly, I guess, and ugly and, and ferocious looking and, you know, grotesque. Um, Argon was angry because we contained it and it couldn't get away. We engaged this incredible battle at one point where this person was able to get out of their body. They could see Argon. They could see the ether. Uh, we, and Chris, we just simply, you know, I just, I just, you know, all I could tell you is what occurred. We, we prayed that their eyes would be open to see what it really was because they knew there were many different kinds of presences out there in the, in the ether. And so when we commanded for their eyes to be open and that no deception would, would, would keep them from seeing what's really there, the person was horrified to see uh, what, they, what they described as just hundreds of thousands of demonic creatures. Um, 
we, you know, eventually, you know, because at first they didn't want to give up Argon because that was their power. To they, they knew they would lose their ability. But when I commanded that Argon tell this person, and we said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Argon, tell this person what it is you're going to do with them and what is your, you know, your real goal. You're under the authority of Jesus. You tell them what you're going to do. And this being screamed out to take them to blankety blank hell. Of course, they cussed, and, you know, they they have no problem with cussing. Um, <laughs> they have no problem. I mean, I don't, you know, uh, <laughs> demons aren't Cheech and Chong, but they can sure cuss like them. Um, so we commanded, it to, you know, they were finally, the person was like, okay, go ahead, get it out. You know, so we commanded and demanded it release and get out and so forth and everything that it gave the person. Well, the person couldn't do it any longer. Um, I think that's true of anybody we dealt with, but that, you know, on the witchcraft side, heavy witchcraft side or satanic side that we're able to do that. So, uh, does in your experience, uh, does leaving the body open one up for demonic possession, or is it was it not really the same mechanics, or or did they already open themselves to demonic possession by having the ability to do it? Well, that's yeah. There'll be some that'll get mad at me over this, but it's okay. Um, there, anybody demonstrating the ability to get out of the body already has been has some level of attachment, some level of empowerment. You cannot get out right. of the body without it. And, uh, it, you know, again, God can do that. I mean, obviously, biblically, it's clear that to leave the body is possible, because in three biblical cases that occurred, Ezekiel, Paul, and John, but in each case, by the Spirit of God. And there was an interaction. So it was really um, protected. Remote viewers nowadays, and I've, you know, I, one, one that I felt burdened for for two years after reading this book, uh, again, a, a satanic chosen one out of the military gave me his phone number. And I called him, and I got a hold of his daughter first, and instantly the Lord gave me a word about his daughter. And then she gave me his number, and I finally called him, and it took a while because he didn't want to trust me at first. But we had interactions, and I still pray for them to this very day. Um, look at all the remote viewers and also astral projectors out there, or if you read any of the New Agers. I mean, high-level people that talk about going on. I was just reading uh, an old book by Monroe here just lately. It's incredible the, the place they say they go, the people they visit, the people they see, you know, all these different things that they can you know, and say and, and, and do. But you're going to notice something, Chris. Not one of them, not one of them would confess Jesus, the real Jesus Christ, as their Savior, Lord, King, anything. Um, at the very least, they might be, uh, and a lot of them do have Mormon background, where the Spirit of God and the real Christ play no part in their spiritual um, you know, experience. Right. None of them. I have not found one. I cannot find one true born again uh, remote viewer or astro projector. It just doesn't. It, it it's not compatible. 